All right, hello, Honors 110. I uh, hope everyone's doing well. Um, I feel like I got to see most of you over the weekend to some extent or another, because uh, I spent a lot of time grading um, and reading uh, the majority of the essays. Um, so as of the time that I'm recording this, um, I have graded and submitted um, scores and feedback to everyone who had their essays in on time by, by the deadline and even a couple who did not. Um, so, so if you haven't seen it yet, I encourage you to go check that out. Uh, make sure you're reading the notes um, because I sort of feel like you just look at the score. Um, you're sort of missing the point of, of the, the, the essay in a sense. I mean, you did the extra of actually writing the thing, um, but the score only tells a, a small portion of the tale. Um, part of my notes is justifying the score, explaining why you wound up where you did for better or for worse. Um, but a big part of it too is kind of giving some suggestions for future essays, um, especially for those of you who maybe didn't do quite as well as you would have hoped, um, giving some, some you know food for thought of things you might consider for future essays in terms of um, ways of structuring an essay and kind of you know approaches to a thesis, um, thinking about topic sentences, thinking about the way we incorporate readings. Uh, those were some of the big things that came up in a lot of papers to varying degrees. But overall, I really appreciate the hard work. It's clear that, that you know pretty much everyone invested in this assignment, um, you know, even for those who didn't turn out quite as well as you would have hoped. Um, nonetheless, it's clear your know, real effort went into all the ones I've seen so far. Um, and for those who turned them in late, I am hopeful that by the end of the day today, I'll be caught up on uh, grading those as well. Um, there's still a couple that I have not yet seen as of the time I'm recording this, so obviously I can't grade it until I get it. So those are the only ones I might not be able to grade yet. Um, but if you thought that you had submitted your essay and you haven't heard anything from me, um, especially by the end of the day today, um, make sure you're double checking um, Canvas to make sure you actually did successfully upload your essay or that you don't have any messages from me about uh, not being able to access your, your file. Um, so, so we can you know, sort out what's going on there um, and then just you know, move ahead from there. But for those folks who, uh, I know this is a very, very small percentage of you, but for those who uh, have not actually completed that essay at this point, really encourage you to prioritize getting that in, both for the sake of your grade. Obviously, there's a late penalty. The later it comes in, the more credit you lose off the top. Um, but, you know, it's beneficial just to, you know, for credit purposes to get it in sooner than later, but also just so you can move on with the class, right? I think that it becomes a real challenge uh, to move on to our identity unit and starting to think about collecting essay ideas for that. And in a few weeks' time, we're going to be writing those essays as well uh, if you still have the dark cloud of a preceding essay hanging over you. So you're just, just clearing that up for yourself, doing the best you can to just, you know, kind of get that done and get that in. Um, okay, so mo moving ahead, though, to today's class, um, we had three separate readings for today's class, and they couldn't be more different, I don't think. Um, they, they do have some connections that I'll get into towards the end of uh, today's video lecture, um, but, but they're definitely uh, different ki kinds of uh, uh, readings here. So I want to start with the Gloria Anzaldúa. I know that some people uh, read this in their Honors 100 class. I, I actually teach it usually in my Honors 100 class, for those of you who are returning uh, to my class. I, I know many of you have encountered this before for. Um, but for this, I see uh, all of these readings, I'm, I'm going to give them um, a relatively quick pass over in part just because they, they bring up such different ideas and I want to leave room in the discussion to explore all of them so I don't get too bogged down in the video lecture uh, talking about any individual one of them. But for the Ansel Dua, um, I, I've had some students say this one really resonates with them for kind of what it has to say about um, language and culture and identity and basically the way that some people have to, you know, learn an additional language and some people have to kind of code switch depending on the situation that they're in and some of these dynamics that Ansel Dua captures really well. And it talks, I think this is more in the introduction than in the body of the reading itself, but about how Ansel Dua, um, you know, wrote in Spanish for parts of this thing and insisted on that Spanish staying in, in the essay itself when it was published um, and her motivations for doing so. So, so it's in the textbook, but nonetheless, I did want to pose that as the first kind of open-ended question to the class, just um, why we think she uses Spanish, why it, it, it's kept there, why she insists on it having to be there. Again, there's some significant clues in the text itself, but also I think some pieces we can read into it and have our own interpretation of. Um, but, but why she did that, what the effect of that was too, right? Because I imagine um, some of you very well might be Spanish speakers. You might have, you know, grown up in a bilingual household. You may have just taken Spanish in high school or, you know, whatever degree Degree, you might have some Spanish in your life, um, or you might be like me, where you have the minimal, minimal Spanish, right? Like the, the amount you kind of encounter in day-to-day -day life, and you're know, having friends who speak Spanish, but but you know not not much beyond that, right? Just kind of some basic phrases, and thus you know had to grapple with the meaning there, or maybe had to stop and look some things up, or make the decision you weren't going to look things up, right? And how that might have affected your reading experience. Um, 
I also want to address the format that, that this essay is delivered in, because there's sort of this mix of um, the personal and historical context, um, you know, and, and sort of what, what that choice is about, what we make of that, um, what, what that does to the essay and our experience reading it to mix these different pieces and to, to jump around in time a little bit, um, to, to work from research and also to work from firsthand experience in Ansel Dua's case, um, what we make of all of that. And then I want to go specifically to page 208, where um, there's a lot of relatively advanced vocabulary throughout this reading, right? Um, but but uh, Ansel Dua uses this word patois in the, in the very uh, end of the first paragraph. It kind of hangs over from the previous page. But we speak a patois, a forked tongue, a variation of two languages. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of you, even being, you know, honor students who uh, likely studied for your SAT or your ACT and boned up on your vocabulary, might still not have known this word, or at least not been confident in your understanding of this word. But basically, you know, it's a dialect of kind of common people of, of a region uh, that defers from kind of the standard language. So sort of in this case, you know, almost a mix of Spanish and English that's kind of informal, not sort of, you know, guided by any specific rules, but just a way that the people who speak it kind of know what they're saying. Um, her use of this word, I, I think, is really telling, right? Because it is telling about her actual situation. Um, I think it speaks to the way that she writes this thing. Um, but also in choosing to use kind of that elevated vocabulary, I think that there might be, even be a little bit of Ansel Dua showing... I know how to play the game, right? Um, I, I've had a life where I've had to overcome challenges where um, you know, I'm a Spanish speaker and uh, I, I've had to kind of adapt to others and not always known what's going on and had to look up big words and things like that. Uh, and she's establishing the, the point of view that she's actually writing this thing from. She knows the big words. She has the big vocabulary, right? Maybe even bigger than, than most of us. Um, and, and still, um, she has these experiences, right? So she's sort of putting us um, in, that, in that position where... Um, She's making every piece of language she uses a really critical choice um, in terms of the, the big vocabulary, in terms of inserting Spanish, um, in terms of the way she tells stories. Uh, and, and I think that those are all really interesting choices, and, I, and I'm curious kind of what, what people make of them. Okay, yeah, I don't want to give any of these, these readings too short shrift, but I also want to you know, have room to talk about all of them in an efficient way without this being uh, a super long video lecture. So I'm going to skip over to, to the Wilson. Um, I expect for most of you, this was probably the most challenging reading out of the three. Uh, so, so I've had some students say the Ansel Dua was more challenging for them, specifically for the Spanish elements. Um, but I think conceptually, um, the Wilson is sort of the least narrative and sort of uh, the least written for a, a generalized audience. So I can certainly understand if there were some, some struggles there in, in that reading. Um, but Wilson works from this framework of evolutionary uh, psychology, which I'm going to pull a definition from Science Daily here, just, just to kind of give you a, a more exact definition of this thing. Um, so evolutionary psychology is a theoretical approach to psychology that attempts to explain useful mental and psychological traits, such as memory, perception, or language, as adaptations, um, i.e. the functional products of natural selection. Um, so, so basically, the, this idea that um, we evolve certain parts of our more cultural selves, the way that we behave, the way we interact with each other, because it had an evolutionary advantage to it at some point, is the perspective of evolutionary psychology. Um, I actually have a friend who is a, a PhD, is an evolutionary psychologist, um, who did a lot of research on um, why men evolved to be attracted to women's butts. Um, so this isn't all sort of, sort of you know, highfalutin kind of, you know, super academic stuff. I mean, they, they approached from a very academic scientific perspective. They actually did a lot of peer-reviewed research around it. Um, but nonetheless, um, it, it can also be used for some more, to explain some more casual kind of, you know, behaviors and preferences um, in, in a culture. So um, in any event, um, you know, on page 359, um, Wil Wilson gets into these big concepts like altruism and patriotism and ethnicity, um, inheritance rules, uh, infanticide, adoption option practices, and kind of how we establish certain norms around these things um, based on whatever provided uh, an evolutionary advantage to us at some point or another, and why these things might look different um, in different cultures depending on what happened with them historically, which I think is a, a pretty interesting point from the perspective of thinking about how we shape kind of collective identity, or again, how our culture kind of affects us on a more individual level. Um, so he talks about this idea of territoriality being a part of social evolution, right? And this idea uh, of kind of scarcity of, of resources and the idea that 
Um, if there if there are relatively few resources, if we have to protect what's ours, that that's going to make us more territorial about our space. Um, so, and I think we, we can apply that to some degree. I would suggest to you know more contemporary circumstances. I'm going to try not to get us overly political here by any means. Um, but when we think about immigration policy, for example, uh, I'm not going to you know, try to sway you to a specific point of view. But I would suggest some of um, people who are for a more strict immigration policy in general, um, you know, for closed borders or, or for you know really high levels of scrutiny around you know who's coming in, um, and you know really really policing you know people who already are here on a legal basis, um, that, that some of it's about um, this idea that we only have so many resources to go around, right? And so we have to protect our resources, therefore we need to protect about the, against these outside folks who are trying to come in and, and take what's not rightfully theirs. Um, I'm way oversimplifying, I'm obviously predicting only one kind of perspective on this thing, so feel free to suss that out more in the discussion, but it's just this idea of territoriality that, that Wilson gets to, I think that, that that is a pretty direct application when we think about immigration policy um, and how we approach it from different perspectives today. Um, okay, and then the last thing I want to bring up is just this idea that I, I, I like just because kind of a practical idea that Wilson brings up about contractual agreements and basically just being this idea that societies form these contractual agreements. Um, the wording he uses is based on a conjunction of selfish interests, right? So, so we, we enter these kind of social contracts on the premise that um, it's going to help me and it's going to help you, um, but, but I care because it helps me, right? So that's why I'm going to buy into it. I need to have that selfish self-investment in order to agree. And I think we, we can express some level of disagreement, right? Because I think we can argue that some people are more invested in helping other people, or at least, um, you know, thinking from a broader, more objective utilitarian standpoint, as opposed to from their own personal selfish gain. But but nonetheless, I, th I think this still exists. I think this is still a, a concept that, that makes some sense we can apply to the real world. Um, okay, the last one I want to go to um, is sort of the, our, our least academic of the reads here, um, the Ellie Slee article um, about the Beyonce video or, or the, the song and kind of the uh, ongoing debate around the song, um, crazy, uh, not crazy, drunk in love, excuse me. Uh, that's another band they song crazy in love. Uh, I'm posting the, the music video, um, below just for kind of a sense of, um, context. Um, it's been a while now since, since this thing came out. So I can legitimately see some people may have just missed this or not remember it very well. Um, or just, this might not have been your style of music. Right. Um, and so I, I can see just kind of, you know, not paying attention to this part of pop culture. Um, but I think it's useful to, to have heard the song at least. I think the video kind of adds on to it for, for what it's worth um, and thinking about what, what's going on here. Um, I'm also going to add a video that's a clip from um, the film What's Love Got to Do With It that, that is heavily referenced in the, the Slee video here, or Slee article here, excuse me. Um, trigger warning, um, it does involve a pretty direct depiction of domestic abuse, first on a more uh, verbal level and then on a, a more physical level. Um, it's a really short clip though, so if you can stomach that sort of thing, I do encourage you to, to, to look at it just to get a sense of, again, what, what Slee is really writing about here um, and why she deems it so problematic that uh, Bounty is sort of romanticizing or, or making light of um, th this, this dynamic between Tina Turner and Ike Turner. Um, so so to, to really just sum up the argument here, though, if you haven't done this part of the reading, please do, because it's the easiest, shortest part of the reading, so you're really kind of uh, only selling yourself short if you don't read it. Um, but this this argument that Sleep pushes that basically Bouncy um, is behaving in a hypocritical fashion, um, because she's come out as a feminist, as a big part of her identity, and you know, has really celebrated that aspect of herself, um, and yet she also includes in this song, um, you know, via the, the rap verse by uh, her husband, Jay-Z, this pretty explicit reference to the relationship between Ike and Tina Turner um, and sort of glamorizes almost, right? Or again, makes light of it because he kind of, you know, he says that he's like Ike and sort of implies, um, you know, what they do with, with each other. Um, and she even sings along for part of it, you know, in a live performance very vocally in the music video, you can see her kind of mouth along some, some of the problematic words. Um, so there, there's a number of levels on which I think that it's useful to read this thing. Um, part of it is, so, so Beyonce, you know, projects, establishes his identity for herself as a feminist. Um, 
and, and sort of Slee is sort of taking that down by calling her hypocritical, by saying she's doing a very unfeminist thing by having this in her song. Um, the degree to which Bansett can declare an identity for herself and kind of what her responsibility is based on that. Um, but also the degree to which Slee can justifiably criticize that choice of identity, right? And suggest that she's wrong, that no, that actually isn't your identity. Uh, well, who is Slee to tell Beyonce what, what her identity is, right? Um, but because we're not having discussion in real time, I'm sure we'll have this out to some degree in the discussion, board. Um, but, but I think that um, generally students, I, I found um, so some disagree with Slee altogether here. Most, I, I think, kind of um, agree in general with the principle that Slee is bringing up here, that yeah, it's problematic what, what Beyonce is doing in this case, um, but also kind of just, but she's also, Slee is kind of blowing this out of proportion a little bit, right? Um, and I think that that's fair. I think that there is a middle ground here. We don't necessarily say that, you know, Beyonce is completely exonerated. We don't have to say that Slee is completely right or completely wrong. Um, we can exist in that, in that gray space in between to some degree, and, and our, our personal reactions are going to fall on some sort of spectrum there. Um, one piece I'll, I'll, I'll get a little bit further into here, you know, because, again, I, sh I show you the music video, it obviously has a lot of, you know, more sexual uh, undertones to it. Um, just kind of, you know, in, in the imagery that's kind of um, put out there in, in the way that, that Beyonce is dressed and the way she dances throughout this thing, um, I, I don't think that she's oblivious to that, right? I think she's very consciously introducing those elements into the music video um, and sort of... Um, what this might actually be saying, right? When, when Daisy takes on this persona of, of Ike Turner, um, the implication that Beyonce would be Tina Turner in this situation, um, you know, one read of this is that um, it, across different generations that they're kind of equivalents. Um, that, that, you know, Ike and Tina Turner, icons of the black music industry, um, Jay-Z and Beyonce, more contemporary icons of, of the, the black music industry, if not the music industry in general, right? But I think that they're not oblivious to, to race here when they, you know, cast those roles as well. Well, um, you know, and, and I think that this song very much, again, being very sexualized and the lyrics points in that direction as well, we could read it to an extent as um, them making a commentary on what, what their private life looks like, right? Maybe they role play, for example, um, in, in these roles. So I'm sure that's, that's what you really wanted to hear from your uh, professor on a Tuesday morning as him talking about uh, major musical acts uh, role playing in the bedroom. I'm going to leave that there. But nonetheless, invite you to engage more with uh, all of those ideas in the discussion thread. Um, so, so, so with all that, uh, one other thing I just wanted to say um, with, with Ellie Slee, um, whether you agree with her or not, um, this is a case of someone taking, um, you know, an artifact, you know, much as we're taking kind of readings from this class um, and building an argument based on that. And she, she has not written this as a formal academic essay with, you know, a, a proper thesis statement and topic sentences and all that. Her voice is obviously a little more informal than I'd recommend um, for, for our essays. But nonetheless, the, the, the major project she's taking on in terms of taking, um, you know, this text and building an argument from it, that's largely what we're doing as well. So I think it's also useful to look at it from that perspective. Um, but for, for all of these readings, um, I think that there's a big sense of sort of um, identity and culture and kind of um, what, what parts of an identity we take on and how, how culture might shape that identity, how um, response to, you know, people around us might, might help shape that identity and what identity we might put on for a more targeted audience at, at a given time. I think all three of these texts in different ways get at those central ideas, um, despite otherwise being kind of all over the map and really different kinds of texts with really different kinds kinds of concerns. So, okay, I think that that's plenty of food for thought for today. So uh, I'll leave it to the discussion thread. Um, let me just double check my notes here. Um, so, okay, no, so ne next time, yeah, we have the Nathan uh, Englander story, um, as well as the, the poems. Um, so, so I encourage you, um, you know, with the readings next time, I'll, I'll give you the heads up. The Nathan Englander uh, story uh, is a more dense short story. So, you know, just to be, you know, prepared for that, that one will probably take you a little bit more time. Uh, but it is a story. And I think if you're able to kind of get through some of the more challenging pieces, I think there's a lot packed in there that I've had a lot of students get a lot out of in the past. Um, the Matea Harvey pieces uh, are poems and with images that go with them. They're a pretty quick read. So, so I think it balances itself out nicely between these two readings. Um, um, but nonetheless, um, can be challenging. So I know most of us don't have a ton of training in poetry. Um, I know some folks you know, were, were challenged by the, the Maggie Nelson poems from Jane that we encountered uh, you know, earlier uh, in this unit. Um, you might have some similar challenges there, but I think also um, these can be kind of fun and kind of interesting to drill into. So, okay, I'll, I'll leave you on that, but thank you all for watching and I'll catch you next time.